Maybe you're a desk eater. Generally eating at my desk. Sitting at my desk okay, either in the office or at home. Could be overlapping meetings, maybe grabbing something on my desk. If I get too busy, I'm spending it in the office, eating at my desk. Or a park walker. Very much just to get outside, get a little sun or, you know, fresh air. Sometimes I go to the gym, but today I'm having lunch in the park with a colleague. I like to go for a walk around. We, we like live and work on an estate, so we go around in a loop on our estate. As soon as I get on lunch, I'm like, right, I'm leaving this. Whether I'm at home or anything, I'm in the garden. A victim of the communal office fridge. I thought someone else's lunch was mine because they used the same lunchbox lid as me. And then after I opened it, I was going to dig in, but then I realised it was not mine. We also have a pet policy in our office. And yeah, lunch has disappeared uh, along with one of our, our four-legged companions. Or perhaps worst of all, the parent responsible for the TikTok-inspired school lunchboxes where everything's cut into tiny little shapes with stickers and notes and the rules about around what you are and aren't allowed to take and the expensive lunchbox and the Stanley drink bottle for a nine-year-old. Kia ora, I'm Davina Zimmer and on the menu today, lunch. How the office culture has changed it, meals on the run, why you shouldn't bother trying to force the latest food fads and crumbs on your keyboard. I have to confess I'm terrible at it because I am an eat at my desk because I'm always running late kind of person. Sophie Gray is a chef and food writer. You might know her as the destitute gourmet. But she also runs a food bank in Auckland which provides lunch ingredients to families so their kids have something to eat at school. But lunch, she says, is not just about food. Lunch is really important in terms of workplace culture. I think that over the last few years, as the work from home or the hybrid working has uh, really become the norm, it's been much, much harder for workplaces to create uh, a workplace culture and interaction and those kinds of things. So um, I think that having a break is actually really, really important. Many people look forward to the midday feast, although some perhaps more than others. RNZ's Wallace Chapman, host of the panel, is just a little bit obsessed with the topic. He's brought it up again. I've got to read extraordinary what people are having around the world in their school lunch uh, table. So what do, you, what do you think about this? In Spain, this is what they have, right? Mm-hmm. School lunches. Sautéed shrimp over brown rice and veggies, gazpacho, fresh peppers, bread and an orange. And again... The lunch break becoming a luxury for many New Zealanders. Massey University Health sociologist Andrew Dickens said that common lunch breaks are almost history. And again... These folks would take breaks as a team using know-how to turn their vans into portable kettles and sandwich makers. Stark contrast today when many such jobs performed remotely by individuals running to tight schedule... Very little time to cram in a service station ham sandwich before going on to the next job. And it seems that obsession is rubbing off, because here's Jesse Mulligan, who sits next to Wallace, is talking to our producer, Gwen McClure. I'm obsessed with lunch. From the moment I get to work in the morning, all I do is think about lunch and look at the clock to decide when I can eat it. And then, and I don't know if this is normal or not, but I asked my co-workers the other day, is it normal that at the end of my lunch, in the last mouthful, I feel a little bit sad that it's over for the day? Well, I don't know if it's normal, but I certainly feel that way as well. What is the earliest appropriate time to eat lunch? I don't think you can eat lunch before quarter to 12. But any time that big hand starts approaching the top of the clock, I think you're in. But it does feel like a uh, uh, a personal failure if I don't make it right through till noon. Yeah, I feel the same. Okay, so we talked to, we heard a little bit from Wallace Chapman about his uh, obsession with lunch breaks. So presumably Wallace eats at his desk as well? I never see Wallace eat, but he's got a shift between six and eight at night, so I think his his meal times are all up the wazoo. Okay, so you can't can't comment on the quality of his lunches? Nor would I if I (laughs) was able to. Here at The Detail, we're mostly midday or thereabouts desk eaters. But on my trips to the RNZ lunchroom, I often encounter a guy whose lunch breaks definitely don't follow Jesse's wait until quarter to 12 rule. So I work shift work, and that could mean that I'm starting anywhere from 5 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and that's the start of my day. So I try and keep as regular a schedule as I can, but that'll translate a bit weirdly when I'm on shift work. So I might be having my lunch on an early shift at 10 in the morning or I might be having my lunch on a late shift at 6 
um, and that can raise some odd looks when you're um, sitting in the break room having like a burger or, or, or some fried chicken at uh, 10 in the morning. And it was his chicken and chips at 10am lunch that prompted me to call Sophie. But it turns out what's in your lunchbox is less important than how you go about the midday or whatever time break. If you have a workplace that has a lunchroom and a microwave and all of those things, there's interaction that happens. There's conversation that happens around that space that isn't necessarily about work. It's about your life. It's an important brain break, but it's also really important for workplace culture as well. So it's less about what you eat. You know, we hear this phrase, you are what you eat. Mm. But in this case, is it more about how and where? I think so. What you are able to do in and around your lunchtime is largely dictated by where you work. Uh, So, you know, if you're on the road all day, then you're far more likely to be buying a sandwich or a pie or a sausage roll from a bakery um, and eating it in a patch of sunshine or in the cab of your vehicle. I've worked in places where you, your break was very, very fixed and you you left your desk, you were signed out during that time, you came back. That was kind of interesting um, because you, you might not necessarily be sharing your break time with somebody else because those phone lines had to be covered, but you did actually take a proper break. Um, I worked in a big media company before COVID and there were rules around what you could and couldn't eat at your desk. So tuna, was banned. Um, and there were some things that there were, people would put notes on the microwave saying, please don't heat such and such in the microwave because it makes all of the downstairs office smell. Um, so if you have a workplace, lunchroom and kitchen, then I think it's really helpful to use it uh, and to have scheduled breaks. But again, it's very, very much determined by your work environment. So if I have a choice between taking an hour for lunch, but having to stay half an hour later at the end of the day, I would far rather bolt down my lunch in half an hour. I would also really enjoy having a chat with my workmates. But if I'm on a deadline, then I'm probably going to work through again to claw back that half an hour at the end of the day. I know that there are a lot of workplaces now who are really encouraging things like, um, you know, the once a month shared lunch or, uh, you know, a sit down um, once a week where the team all get together or actually a scheduled lunch break because workplace culture has kind of disintegrated It's safe to say that change in culture hasn't gone unnoticed, at least by Wallace and Jesse. I want to talk about a light note, desk dining. It's the norm and long gone a daily hour, long lunches with workers and colleagues. I see people sitting around in the lunchroom and I think, do you not have enough to do? Which is sad because um, for some time it was quite a normal thing to take an hour's break from work to eat your lunch. But no, uh, with me it's usually sandwich in left hand, editing audio in right hand. Here's Sophie's take on what's caused the shift. There are fewer cafes in our busy city centres than there were five years ago. Uh, It's more expensive to buy food out. Uh, I think decades ago people didn't really take leftovers very often. You might take a sandwich, but now it's very acceptable to bring your leftover from the night before's dinner because your office kitchen likely has a microwave. There may be a toasted sandwich maker. I used to work in an office where people would routinely bring their prepared toasted sandwich and the only thing it needed was to go in the toaster sandwich maker. There is um, a sense to where you engage with people over what they've brought for lunch. Oh, that looks nice. I just talked to a total stranger in your lift as I was coming up here because they were having a shared lunch on the second floor and she had a big container with what looked like a really delicious beetroot and carrot grated salad with crumbled feta on the top. And it's like we were talking about her lunch contribution, even though she had no idea that I was coming in and we were going to be talking about lunch today, because people engage over food in ways that they simply don't over other things. Of course, those lunch conversations aren't always positive. Hey there, lunch buddies. Hey, Lisa. Oh, no. Oh, no, what? Oh! What is that? What? It's tuna. Oh, God. Put it away. Cover it. What? You don't bring tuna? To a public eating area? There's a bit of, uh, I guess, office etiquette. What role does that play in choosing what to have? Well, workplaces are shared spaces and you are there for the purpose of work. And if you're distracted because you are struggling with the smell of somebody's lunch, then that is really problematic. Um, The big media office I worked in, we had 270-odd staff at about, I would say, 
87% of them were women. So there was a high likelihood that there was somebody who was morning sick. There was probably also somebody who was doing their pre-wedding shred. So they were living on tuna at the same time somebody was dashing to the bathroom every sort of 25 minutes to call God on the great white telephone. So, so you know, actually being considerate around those things. You know, there were also vegans and vegetarians and, you know, all different kinds of people in the office. The fridge, that could sometimes become a bit of a battleground, you know, people's food disappearing. Did you confuse it with your own turkey sandwich with a moist maker? No. Do you perhaps remember seeing a note on top of it? That said, it was my sandwich. Or people who would bring lunch, go out for lunch, leave their lunch sitting in the fridge until it was a mouldering mess, um, and somebody else was then having to deal with it. There was also bin etiquette. Um, There were five bins, and there was a bit of a name and shame culture going on if somebody was seen accidentally putting something into the wrong bin. You know, those things, they affect some people more than they affect others. But they're, they are all really minor. I think the, the meeting over food is still the thing that's really important and something that, that, that we really have lost over the last few years. How do you balance choosing what to have, bearing in mind, you know, the way that it smells that may trigger other people, maybe unpleasant, with also finding something that you enjoy? I'm just thinking back to my school lunch when I was a child. My mum always packed me, you know, capsicum sticks. Right with avocado and I remember being told oh your lunch smells how do you kind of think okay look, maybe people don't like the smell of tuna but it is something that I really enjoy how do you balance that um, I think that you do actually have to consider people other than yourself um, I'm a big fan of the eggy sandwich or a hard boiled egg and they, they can be whiffy as well so if I was going to eat those I'd eat them in the lunch room or I would um, go outside into the fresh air and have a break I don't think it's hard to be considerate and to use your common sense I think the capsicum and um, avocado is just kids being kids. weird uh, Yeah, they, they were looking at your healthy lunch and their peanut butter sandwich and going oh that's a bit different right. These days, school lunches are a whole new nightmare, especially if you're under the influence of influencers. Let's make some lunch for my kids. Today, I'm making a sandwich. I'm cutting out letters A, B, and C, and the numbers 1, 2, and 3. We are doing breakfast for lunch, and here we have pancakes, peanut butter, and banana on a stick with a little bit of maple syrup. For my daughter's lunch today, we are doing a deconstructed ramen bowl. I'm using a yellow bell pepper for Elmo's nose. I think it, there is a huge pressure around kids' lunches, you know, the, the TikToks and the Instagrams of complicated kids' lunches where everything's cut into tiny little shapes with stickers and notes and the rules about around what you are and aren't allowed to take and the expensive lunchbox and the Stanley drink bottle for a, a nine-year-old and so on. There's an awful lot of pressure mm. around that. You mentioned earlier, you know, you're on a bit of a cheese and cracker default lunch. In a survey, actually, the State of Snacking report that came out this year actually showed that the number of people that replace lunch with a snack Hmm. has actually grown to over 50%. I think it's 58% now, up from 48% in 2019. Why do you think that more people are choosing to snack instead of actual lunch? I think because we are working harder and under more time pressure. So our workplace environments have changed. When I was uh, a young parent, it was really common for women to spend a year or so at home uh, and then maybe return into work when the kids were school age. Now, that is not the case. So you might have a family that you are preparing lunches for, you're getting kids ready for daycare, then you're racing out the door, you are doing a full day often in your office, then you're herring home, picking up kids, taking them to activities, trying to sling something together for dinner. So grabbing a bunch of things that are in packets or some stuff that requires very little preparation just saves time. Um, My assistant will plan a week's worth of salads in jars, have them all lined up in the fridge, bring those to work. But actually some days if we're really under pressure, that jar of salad stays in the fridge and she's grabbed a handful of Maltesers and some crackers and, you know, bits and pieces while we're rushing around. Mm -hmm. So even with the best will in the world, depending on your day and 
how you're feeling. The snack also might be much more appealing than the salad that you thoughtfully prepared the night before. It could also be that after searching for lunch inspiration online, you're left so confused and overwhelmed that a packet of crackers is all that you can think of to settle a grumbling tummy. I'm a dietitian, and this is my simple portion hack guide for dinner time. Did you know the order in which you eat your food can affect your blood sugar? Start by serving yourself half a plate of colourful veggies. It is much better to eat meals, not snacks. Add a quarter of a plate of protein. Here are five of the most important superfoods that you should be eating. And a quarter of a plate of fibre-filled carbs. And liver, eggs... Broccoli. Fasting is more effective than a calorie deficit. Chocolate and also blueberries. The carnivore diet, keto, gluten-free, vegan, not eating before 10 a.m., not eating after 8 p.m., always eating your veggies first. With the internet at our fingertips, it can feel like everyone has their two cents on how to fuel your body. So is there an ideal lunch? I think you want to make the hungry go away so that you don't end up diving into the snacks at at three in the afternoon, maybe some whole grains and maybe some protein. Uh, I don't know that it's very realistic to be trying to get a huge amount of your five plus a day in for a lot of people. So it might be that you have a piece of fruit. But the really important thing is making sure that you are not hungry because otherwise you will get to three o'clock in the afternoon and you'll either want to have a nap or you'll be hitting the lollies and the chocolate biscuits. If you haven't had time to make lunch, keeping some porridge sachets in your office drawer so you can go into the kitchen and make a bowl of porridge on a cold day is probably going to be more nourishing and, and cheaper and actually potentially more pleasing than a pie or a handful of chips or you know those kinds of things. It really depends on the facilities that you have. It's those things are simple without actually having to go too deep into the macros and the, you know, is this an ultra processed or is it a what? Well, you know, keep it simple, do what you can manage and try not to be too influenced by what other people around you are doing because they're doing it because it's what makes them feel well worrying about whether or not it's vegan and how many air miles it had and you know, those kinds of things just, just ends up actually making food far more difficult than potentially it should be. It should still be a pleasure. If you if you have a specific dietary issue, you have to address that. But if you're just a normal, healthy person and you are a reasonable, healthy weight, just keep doing what you're doing. Whatever you can manage is probably better than nothing. That was going to be my next question, is your thoughts on skipping lunch? Uh, I think we are all different. So I have a son who is not a lunch eater, never been a lunch eater as a kid. I only put lunch in his bag so that I didn't get sent to the home for bad mummies. Um, he would, wouldn't eat it, but he would eat it for afternoon tea. He wasn't hungry in the middle of the day. As long as you've got food there for when you want it, um, so I will frequently not eat at lunch time. but about half past two in the afternoon is when I'm ferreting around and pulling out my snacks or my lunch, which is quite often quite often looks like breakfast, actually. I quite mm. often have um, granola with yogurt and berries because... I don't do so well with wheat. That's what you feel like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So um, eating it at the time that's important so that you get through without just hitting the junk food. I don't know that it really matters what time. But if you do have that workplace shared lunch once a week, do it. Be part of it. Mm, because we do have this societal ingrained habit of breakfast is around seven, lunch is around midday, mm. dinner is around six o'clock or yeah, seven something again. something like that, yeah. But that was made for the traditional nine to five worker, wasn't it? Absolutely. But we don't necessarily have that anymore. No, we don't. And snacks are a really modern invention as well. Snacks, the idea of snacks and that, that you need to be snacking and feeding yourself through the day is a really modern concept. It's only been around for about 50 odd years. So we very much tend to try and fuel ourselves almost continually. Mm. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily necessary. And there are there are different trains of thought. There are the intermittent fasting people who say, actually, your system does really well when you give it a break. It boosts your immune system. Overall, you might consume less calories and better quality calories. And then there are the other people who say, no, keep your energy consistent through the day. And I suspect that that actually really depends on your body and your energy needs. Sophie's main message is to keep it simple and listen to your body. 
But she says certain kinds of jobs can make that tricky. When I used to do night shift at the police, we, you'd sometimes end up eating four meals a day because about 3 a.m. sometimes the like leadership team would come around with a trolley with big tubs of ice cream and things like that. You know, once a month they would do a shared thing and everybody would bring food in so that, you know, there were still people on the phone, but they would come around your desks because everybody's fighting to stay awake, stay alert, really be on. So the calories were part of keeping everybody awake and alert, but it also kept a sort of playful and fun atmosphere and and that kind of thing. When you'd started work at 9 p.m., you felt like you needed a meal at half past two in the morning. And I guess if you're awake for longer, yes, of course you need more food, right? Mm. And you get, you just get hungry. You end up just eating more because you're tired. Yeah. Um, and there is a lot of research around the fact that people who don't sleep enough eat more calories. And to wrap things up, here are some of Sophie's lunch suggestions. I think if you are able to claw some of last night's dinner to use as today's lunch, whether or not that's you cooking an extra bit of chicken that you then just slice up and chuck into some of last night's salad that you've set aside before you plate the dinner, um, that can actually circumvent that sense of I'm having to do meal prep. That can actually be quite a useful little strategy. It's like I'm going to take my lunch out before I plate dinner pop that in a container in the fridge. Um, Making sure that you've got things like bread rolls in the freezer, you've got stuff that that is easy to stuff into a roll or a sandwich, that kind of thing. I do think that we have access now to things like a porridge sachet, quite useful to keep in the office drawer for the day when it is cold and a bit miserable and you and you fancy something warm. Soup is a really good thing to make in bulk and freeze, even for in the summer. And I freeze it in small Ziploc bags because you can freeze it flat. So by the time you come to want to use it, it's pretty much defrosted and you can just pour it into a cup and microwave it. You know, even in and around making sure you've got fruit that's portable, filling and that you are still going to fancy by the time you get to lunchtime because what you aspire to at night and what you actually fancy when you get to lunchtime can be really, really different things. If you're packing lunches for the kids, you could actually just pack yourself what you're doing for them. Keep it simple. That seems yeah. to be the main message. Is well, just... otherwise, if it's difficult, you're just not going to do it. And then you'll, you will end up in the bakery or you'll end up going to the cafe and buying the really expensive thing. And then you'll want the coffee as well. And then you'll be kicking yourself later because you didn't necessarily intend to do that three days this week. And not every workplace has access to somewhere as well. well I, one office I worked in in the city, the only place within reasonable walking distance was a raw cafe. Um, It was really expensive and the food was incredibly calorie dense. Uh, So if you were doing a raw diet, it was a really great option. But for anybody else, it was really problematic. So Mm. if you didn't take lunch, you were really stuck or you were looking at a really long walk into the CBD to try and find something. You know, there are things, you know, there are sandwiches that you can make ahead and freeze, you know, make make a batch of savoury muffins at the weekend and whack them in the freezer so that you can just pull one of those out. Those things are really inexpensive. They're filling, they're nourishing. Homemade granola bars or bought ones, you know, if you like that kind of thing, do one that's not full of sugar. Um, if you're doing something slightly, you know, rice-based for dinner, the night before, absolutely. Make some extra, take it for your lunch. That's all for today. The Detail is a newsroom production supported by RNZ and New Zealand On Air. This episode was engineered by Phil Benj, produced by Gwen McClure and Alexia Russell, and I'm Davina Zimmer. Thank you to Sophie Gray, Kakite Anno. Anu.